Disclaimer. Most of Black Mirror's episodes include references, gags, and callbacks to episodes outside of the normal continuity. The following is an attempt to best fit all of Black Mirror in a single linear timeline, showing the progression of the show's technology from the alternate contemporary present to the show's proposed future. Black Mirror is extremely referential, and oftentimes the technology doesn't progress the way you'd expect it to in relation to other episodes. In mapping out this timeline, I did my best to line up certain stories with their references and other material. Things like news articles, headlines, and spoken cross-references were used in this timeline as mostly concrete evidence for how things line up, whereas things like easter eggs, symbols, and anecdotes were treated as non-essential if they created errors in the continuity. Still, this timeline's not perfect, and there are very likely many holes that you could pick out in the progression I've mapped out to follow. Please do let me know of said errors in the comments section below. I intend to correct this video in the future, as well as update it as the new episodes of the series are released. A huge thanks to Bryce Edward Brown, whose channel I used as a cross-reference to plug holes in and expand my original script. If you like this video, definitely check out his playlist detailing all Black Mirror Easter eggs. Thanks for watching. Do all the YouTube things if you happen to like this video. We begin our timeline with 1964. Randy Newman and Jeannie Seeley write Anyone Who Knows What Love Is Will Understand. The song is picked up and recorded for the first time by Irma Thomas and released by Imperial Records later that year. 1969. In an alternate timeline to our own, astronauts Cliff and David are two years into a six-year mission to deep space. To maintain their sanity and maintain a connection to life on Earth, both utilize synthetic replicas, robotic copies of themselves through which they are able to transfer their consciousness and live out double existences both in space and back home. While the technology is praised by a vast majority of the American public, a sizable minority disagrees with the ethics of fake humans walking the Earth and raising families in the shadow of their true selves. A group of cultists who subscribe to this mantra break into David's house. They murder his family and destroy his replica, leaving David's consciousness trapped in space and haunted by the loss of his very real wife and children. Sympathetic to David's emotions and boredom, Cliff and his wife Lana agree to let David use Cliff's replica to grieve on Earth and relieve his trapped consciousness. Using the excuse of painting a picture of Cliff's home on Earth as a reason to keep using his replica, David eventually falls for Lana, mistaking her physical attraction to her husband's physical form as attraction to David himself. After Cliff discovers nude sketches of Lana aboard the ship, he becomes convinced of an affair, while Lana agrees to ban David from returning to Earth through Cliff's replica. During a spacewalk to repair the damage to the cooling system, which David himself triggered, he traps Cliff outside the ship long enough to use his replica one last time, using Cliff's own body to murder his wife and children. 1979. Nita represses thoughts of violence against co-workers and customers who show her xenophobic hostility. Forced to eat her traditional meals in the basement of her workplace, she cuts her finger and bleeds on an ancient talisman, triggering a young demon named Gop to convince her to fulfill three ritualistic killings in order to prevent the apocalypse. She kills two men, Tim Simons and Keith Holligan, before also killing Keith's brother as a witness. Later told Keith's murder did not count, due to his lack of moral innocence, she turns her attention to nationalist politician Michael Smart, who she subconsciously blames for her social insecurities. Driving Smart off the road, after one of his rallies, she attempts to hammer in his skull as her third sacrifice, but is stopped by police who had trailed her under suspicion of the previous two murders. Arrested, and now convinced that the world is going to end, Nita commits to accompanying Gop after the apocalypse in eternal torment. Later on, Michael Smart is elected as the MP for Tipley. 1984. Young programmer Stefan Butler focuses on adapting the choose-your-own-adventure book Bandersnatch into an interactive video game. He pitches the game to the company Tuckersoft, where he meets famous developer Colin Rittman. On Colin's advice, Stefan rejects the company's offer to help him finish the game, and instead chooses to do it himself. Overwhelmed by stress from the game, he struggles through interactions with others, and eventually realizes similarities between his life and the book's author Jerome Davies, who became hyper-fixated on the infinite paths the book could take, and eventually beheaded his own wife. Stefan becomes convinced that his actions are being controlled by people from the future, and eventually finishes the game, but loses his mind and murders his own father. The game is released to critical acclaim, but is almost immediately recalled when the details of Stefan's arrest come to light. Elsewhere, the British government began experimenting with memory recall technology. 1987. 21-year-old Yorkie runs away from home after coming out to her rejecting parents. Getting in a serious car accident, she's completely paralyzed for the rest of her life. 1997. Michael Smart is ousted from the Conservative Party for an openly racist speech he gives in front of his Tipley constituents. He later declares his intention to create his own political party, which better reflects and supports his views openly. 
In Scotland, Ian Adair continues a year-long stretch of kidnapping tourists from the small town of Loch Henry and torturing them alongside police officer Kenneth McArdle and his wife Janet. The trio film their acts of torture on the tail end of McArdle's collection of Bergerac VHS tapes. Adair becomes reckless, openly threatening the patrons of the town pub. Worried he will expose their crimes, the McArdles conspire to murder Adair and frame him for sole responsibility in the murders. Kenneth, under the guise of police investigation, confronts Adair at his home, kills him and his parents, as well as their current imprisoned victims, then shoots himself to cover up his involvement. The media swarm to Lock Henry when the crimes are uncovered, but the town soon falls silent after they disappear to cover the death of Princess Diana. At the hospital, being treated for his gunshot wound, Kenneth contracts MRSA and later dies from the infection, leaving behind his wife and their young son Davis. 2006 a paparazzo named Bo gains notoriety for photographing actor Justin Camley with a male lover, outing him in a very public media spread. Disenchanted by the reactions to her photos and the fact that Camley kills himself, Bo temporarily leaves the profession before being drawn back in by the disappearance of Maisie Day, an actress who disappeared after filming in the Czech Republic, who briefly reappeared in the United States and then disappeared again. Bo and a team of fellow paparazzi track Maisie to a hideout in California, where she's shackled to a bed as part of a brutal detox to rid her of lycanthropy. After she escapes and kills Bo's partners and a number of locals, Macy begins to transform back into her human shape, begging Bo to kill her. Instead, Bo encourages Maisie Day to kill herself, and photographs her, and seemingly sells the photos to the tabloids. In Iceland, Mia Nolan is driven home from an all-nighter by her partner Rob. Both intoxicated and high on narcotics, Rob unintentionally strikes and kills a cyclist along the side of a highway. Realizing the severity of their situation, and how easy it would be to hide the body given the local geography, they dump he and his bike into a lake, swearing to never speak of the event again. 2009. Sarah, the three-year-old daughter of an overbearing single mother named Marie, goes missing from a playground after chasing a cat. Distraught following a day-long search for her daughter, Marie decides to sign Sarah up for an experimental technology called Archangel, which uses a cranial implant to allow parents to see and hear what their children do by way of a digital interface, as well as be able to control and limit exposure to things like trauma and violence. Negative repercussions emerge almost immediately, when Sarah is unable to witness and therefore react to her grandfather having a stroke, as well as his later death and Marie's period of grieving. Around the same time, Tuckersoft, now using the name Ticker Systems, releases the original console version of Striking Vipers. 2015. The communications powerhouse Smithereen becomes the world's most used social media platform. Checking a Smithereen notification on his phone while driving home one night, Chris Gillaney is struck head-on by another driver, killing said driver as well as his own wife, Tamsin. In the investigation of the crash, it's discovered that the other driver was intoxicated, and therefore Chris is completely absolved of responsibility for the two deaths. Now nine years old, Sarah has become a social outcast as a result of the Archangel system now being outlawed across the world. Having lacked stressful stimulation her entire life, she becomes frustrated that she is unable to interact with certain things in her world. Curious about the concept of blood, she cuts her finger and assaults her mother when Marie tries to stop her. On the advice of a psychologist, Marie is urged to stop using the Archangel program altogether, and ultimately decides to let Sarah live unsupervised. Almost immediately, Sarah asks a classmate to expose her to things she was previously unable to view, including pornography and graphic violence. In the United Kingdom, Ian Rannick kidnaps six-year-old Jemima Sykes alongside his fiancée, Victoria Skillane, having premeditated the act for years prior. Victoria films Ian torturing, killing, and burning Jemima on her mobile phone, while the girl pleads for her to help. Having left behind her white teddy bear during the kidnapping, an extensive manhunt for the disappeared girl centers around the symbol of the white bear. After Ian is identified by his distinctive neck tattoo, the pair are arrested, though Ian kills himself before the trial can commence. 2017. Princess Susanna, a popular member of the British royal family, is drugged and kidnapped while attending the wedding of a college friend by Turner Prize-winning artist Carlton Bloom. Bloom forces Susanna to read off his demands for her safe return. Prime Minister Michael Callow must have filmed intercourse with a pig on national television prior to 4 o'clock that afternoon. The government becomes swiftly aware of the situation and attempts to block the film demands from going public by way of a media denotice, but as the video is uploaded to a server outside the UK, it goes viral. With no way to communicate terms with the kidnapper, Callow exercises as many outroutes as possible, including using CGI to digitally paste his face over the body of adult actor Rod Senseless. As the day progresses and all efforts to avoid the act are brought to the attention of the kidnapper, Bloom cuts off his own finger and delivers it to the Prime Minister passing it off as Susanna's. The public outcry following the defingering results in public polls demanding Callow to go through with the act. 
With time running out and his reputation on the line, the Prime Minister is broadcast across the nation fulfilling the demands. Meanwhile, Bloom releases Susanna in London 30 minutes prior to the event actually taking place, then takes responsibility for the kidnapping and hangs himself. Callow's public opinion rises with the ownership of footage of the event now illegal, though the act remains well within the public consciousness. Privately, Callow suffers PTSD from the event, and his relationship with his wife begins to strain. Across the United Kingdom, an anti-malware program called Shrive doubles as a Trojan horse, allowing programmers access to the video cameras, microphones, and various data clouds of users who install Shrive to their computers and phones. One of, or potentially a group of these hackers, begins an elaborate blackmailing scheme, threatening to expose classified, embarrassing, or incriminating information about the downloaders if they fail to follow the hacker's instructions to commit various acts and crimes. Kenny, a teenager who is caught downloading and pleasuring himself to underage pornography, becomes forced into these games alongside Hector, a married father who is caught having an affair with a prostitute. The pair are forced to rob a bank at gunpoint before separating, with Hector tasked with destroying the getaway vehicle and additional evidence, while Kenny is pitted against another exposed pedophile to fight to the death on livestream over the stolen cash. Both are successful in their respective missions, but both are still exposed by these hackers, revealing the whole ordeal to have been part of a massive trolling network. 2018. Furthering the expansion of consciousness-based technology, Smartelligence develops a physical controller called a cookie. The cookie is created by copying the consciousness of a smart home owner and using the uploaded copy as an operator with the same desires as the original host. As these copies are no different psychologically from their original selves, the role falls to Matt Trent to break the copies into a new life of submissive servitude. Three years after the crash that killed his wife, Chris Gilhaney has become a hermit, crippled by the guilt of causing the crash and nobody learning the truth. Now a rideshare driver for Hitch, he regularly parks outside the regional Smithereen headquarters in London to carry out a rehearsed plan to tell his story to Smithereen CEO Billy Bauer. Coming across an intern named Jaden, who he mistakes as a company executive by the way he's dressed, Chris kidnaps Jaden and attracts the attention of the police before realizing his mistake. After a police chase, Chris and Jaden are forced to a halt in a field. Realizing he is too far gone to ever try his plan again, Chris uses Jaden as leverage to contact Billy Bauer, who is on a technology cleanse in Utah, and is tracked down by Smithereen executives while they, the FBI, and local police attempt to talk Chris down. Eventually able to speak with Bauer, Chris admits fault for the accident to him, and blames Bauer for creating the instrument that caused his ill decision. Bauer apologizes to Chris and attempts to absolve himself of the company's overexpansion, but this has no effect on Chris's decision, and he resolves to kill himself. As his dying wish, Chris has Bauer contact the CEO of a rival social media company to unlock the account of a girl who previously killed herself without a cause, hoping to put her grieving mother at peace. Finally off the call, Chris's suicide is interrupted by Jaden, and their struggle over Chris's handgun leads to police firing at Chris and unintentionally killing them both. Following a wildly successful run as a side role on late night television, comedian Jamie Salter is awarded his own spin-off for his popular Waldo character. In brainstorming how to get the new series started with a bang, the creative team proposes running for parliament in Stentonford after the incumbent conservative MP resigns following indisputable allegations of pedophilia. Leading the race is fellow conservative Liam Monroe, who becomes the clear frontrunner in the traditionally blue district, as well as the target of a comedic spear by the Waldo team. After Waldo's legitimacy as a candidate is questioned during a televised debate, Jamie uses his television time to expose both the candidates and the system, leading to a rapid increase in Waldo's electoral popularity. Though Monroe wins the election and Jamie is removed as Waldo's operator, the impact on the system is made, and Waldo's rights remain with the network. Following an offer from the CIA, Waldo becomes a political and entertainment symbol, used to push various totalitarian ideas on an unaware populace. 2019. Ticker Systems begins transitioning outside their usual realm of communications and gaming, beginning work on a euthanasia service called the San Junipero Project. After moving into their new home, Ash is killed en route returning the moving van. Overwhelmed by grief, his partner Martha learns of a technology service which uses the social media profile of deceased family members to recreate an artificial chatbot which mimics that person. Originally horrified by the idea, Martha changes her mind when she discovers that she's pregnant with Ash's child. Using the bot to bring comfort, the technology eventually develops into a vocal mimic, and then the capability to grow an organic clone of Ash into a perfect replica of his digital self. Desperate to have her partner back, Martha takes advantage of this clone, but becomes increasingly less comfortable with the little differences between Ash's personal quirks and the way he acted online. Finally concluding that the clone is an empty copy of the man she once loved, Martha attempts to force it into suicide, but eventually allows the clone to stay in the attic, acting as a distant father figure to their daughter. 
Soon after this, Michael Smart is elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to replace Michael Callow. Elsewhere, the video game powerhouse Saito Gamu is experimenting with a new implant technology, allowing the human consciousness to create its own entertainment by way of augmented reality code within the implant. Having run away from home to escape the guilt left by caring for his now-deceased father with Alzheimer's, Cooper travels the world before ultimately running out of accessible money in London. Needing funds to finally return home to Syracuse, he's persuaded by a hookup to volunteer at Saito Gamu, where he becomes a test subject for the new augmentation implant. Also attempting to make money from leaking the top-secret technologies within Saito Gamu, Cooper reactivates his foam, which was taken and shut off upon entry, to capture pictures of Saito's new programming. Not knowing that the implant technology is highly dangerous when exposed to cellular signals, Cooper is killed when his mother calls during the implanting process. The cellular interference fries the entirety of his brain near instantaneously, during which he hallucinates exposure to the new Saito project, which deals with augmented horror gaming, and the deaths of both his mother and himself from Alzheimer's. It becomes apparent that this is not the first time a test subject has been killed or seriously injured by the technology. In Scotland, Davis McArdle and his girlfriend Pia return to Loch Henry to film a documentary on a local egg farmer. Upon visiting Davis's old friend Stuart, Pia learns of the Adair murders and becomes infatuated with the idea of covering them instead, despite knowing Davis's father's connection to and death because of them. They interview a handful of locals, including Davis's mother Janet, who encourages them to film over her large collection of old Bergerac tapes. The duo pitch the documentary to producer Kate Cesar, who pushes them to find a personal angle on the subject for it to become more marketable. They, alongside Stuart, decide to explore the torture dungeon for potential insight about the acts and victims. Driving home from the dungeon, Davis crashes the vehicle, earning he and Stuart a night in the local hospital. Meanwhile, Pia continues editing the documentary with the footage from the Bergerac tapes. Leaving the tape playing far past the recorded material, she's horrified to find the footage of Janet and Kenneth committing the torture alongside Ian Adair. Janet becomes suspicious after Pia flees the house in terror, chasing her into the countryside where Pia inadvertently trips and drowns in a nearby stream. Realizing she has no option left to hide from her involvement, Janet hangs herself and donates the footage of the murders to her son for use in the documentary. In London, Prime Minister Michael Smart unveils a new series of robotic police dogs for use by the Metropolitan Police. In partnership with the virtual reality interface of Ticker Systems, Saito Gamu releases Striking Vipers X, a hyper-realistic, all-immersive reworking of the original Striking Vipers game. College friends Danny and Carl reunite at the birthday party of the former's three-year-old son, with Carl gifting Danny both a copy of the new game and his own Ticker headpiece. The two play online, selecting their favorite characters from their college days, and after engaging in an exhausting round of fighting, kiss using their avatars. Realizing how immersive the technology truly is, they begin having regular meetups in the game and using the characters to live out sexual fantasies. Confused by what this tryst means for both their relationship and their respective sexualities, the pair struggle in their own personal lives, and upon failing to conceive a second child with his wife Theo, Danny stops playing the game and abandons his friendship with Carl. When Carl is later invited to Danny's birthday as a surprise from Theo, the pair reconnect and later have sex again in the game. Again confused by his feelings, Danny invites Carl in reality to an old hangout, where the pair kiss in a test of their feelings for one another outside the game. When Danny again rejects Carl, the pair fight each other and are arrested for disorderly conduct. Picked up from the police station by Theo, Danny is forced to come clean about the in-game affair, and they come to an agreement in which once a year they are both allowed to live out their fantasies with another person. 2020. Davis McArdle, Kate Cesar, and the team at Streamberry win the BAFTA for Best Documentary. In the aftermath of its release, the town of Loch Henry has become a true crime tourist hotspot. Elsewhere, Sho Saito is held responsible for the death of Cooper and a handful of other volunteers within Saito Gamu headquarters, with a massive trial underway to weigh the options of human testing on experimental technology. Ticker Systems begins experimenting with technology allowing the transfer of memories between parties, using rats during their trial runs. Failing their initial goal, they unintentionally discover the ability to transfer physical sensations, and greenlight a medical device which allows doctors to feel the pain of their patients and properly register a diagnosis. Rollo Haynes, the researching recruiter for Ticker, finds his first client in Peter Dawson, an emergency doctor with a failing record. Dawson is implanted with a digital receiver, while his clients are outfitted with a helmet which registers and sends physical sensations. After a senator is poisoned and Dawson fails to diagnose the problem in time, the senator is killed and Dawson suffers a drastic neural reset, which changes his brain's reception of pain into pleasure. Hooked on the idea of pain, he becomes obsessed with inaction in the emergency room and eventually loses his job after becoming aroused around dying patients. 
Dawson begins to mutilate himself, but eventually bores of mutilation when he realizes he lacks the fear to fuel his pain. To counter this, he traps and tortures a homeless man to death, resulting in his brain frying completely and spending the rest of his life in a coma. Haynes pitches another ticker product to Jack, the husband of a now comatose woman named Carrie, who is struck by a passing truck. With technology now allowing the uploading of a copied consciousness into a host's psyche, Carrie's consciousness is transferred into Jack's body, where it shares the space with his own mind. As conflict grows between the two parties, Jack eventually has Carrie's consciousness removed from his psyche and placed in a physical interface in the form of a stuffed monkey. Having witnessed her husband move on and her son grow up without her, Carrie goes insane, unable to communicate with more than two basic phrases. Around the same time, Clayton Lay is arrested, tried, and sentenced to death for murder, a charge in which he vehemently denies his involvement. After the trial turns negatively against him, his wife and a group of social organizers begin a series of protests to overturn his conviction, but no headway is made, and the protests slowly die out. 2021. Fifteen-year-old Sarah has finally fallen in with a social group. Staying out too late for apparently the first time, her mother reactivates the Archangel technology out of worry for the first time in six years. Confused by Sarah's active location, she activates the visual control and witnesses Sarah having sex with Trick. Distraught and now mistrustful of her daughter, Marie keeps the technology on, later watching Sarah snort narcotics with Trick. Marie identifies Trick and tracks him down, threatening him to stay away from her daughter. And later, Marie discovers via Archangel that Sarah is pregnant, and sneaks an emergency contraceptive into her usual morning breakfast. Made extremely sick by the pill, Sarah learns of it thanks to her school nurse. Almost immediately connecting the dots back to Archangel, she learns about her mother's witness to her life choices and instrumentation in why Trick has since removed himself from her life. Marie returns home prior to Sarah running away, and the two physically fight, leading to Sarah beating her mother senseless, destroying the Archangel controller, and finally running away. Mia Nolan is now married with a nine-year-old son, and is a renowned urban designer and social architect. In Reykjavik for an architectural conference, she takes the time on her trip to reunite with Rob, who reveals his intention to finally apologize to the cyclist's wife, anonymously after 15 years. Worried that this slight admission of guilt could lead to her own arrest and destroy the life she has now built for herself, Mia kills Rob and smuggles his body out of her hotel, burying him in the construction yard of one of her projects. At the same time that Rob is killed, an automated pizza truck outside her hotel strikes a musician and breaks his arm, leading to a significant lawsuit. The insurance agent investigating the incident, Shazia, uses a popular police technology called a recaller, which allows her to capture a visual and audio record of memories from witnesses. When her trail of unreliable witnesses leads her to Mia, she unintentionally reveals Mia's guilt over Rob's murder, and Mia kidnaps Shazia to remove her as a witness. Using Shazia's own recaller, Mia learns that Shazia's husband knows where she is, then kills Shazia and travels to her home to eliminate him as another witness. She beats him to death in the bathtub, only to realize this act was witnessed by the couple's infant son. Killing the baby but failing to see a guinea pig in the room, Mia is tracked down by the police and arrested after they later use the recaller on the animal. Pop star Ashley O launches Ashley 2, a personal assistant doll with a digital copy of her own consciousness uploaded into the interface. Disillusioned with the consumerist direction of her music career and feeling trapped under the watch of her manager and Aunt Catherine, Ashley voices her intention to expand away from the traditional pop industry. To combat this, Catherine has Ashley medicated and kept under constant surveillance. Discovering Catherine's actions and realizing that forced medication nulls the contract which keeps Catherine as her manager and legal representative, Ashley attempts to expose the truth, have Catherine arrested, and finally gain control over her own life and career path. Before this can happen, however, Catherine force-feeds Ashley her missed medication, leading to Ashley falling into a severe coma, and Catherine's team excusing it as a reaction to an undiagnosed shellfish allergy. While in the coma, it's discovered that Ashley is still dreaming about music, and using a revolutionary memory-based technology, Catherine's team are able to create new music and ultimately use Ashley's unconscious body as a content factory. Realizing they also have thousands of hours of Ashley's personality, mannerisms, and performance records on file thanks to the Ashley 2 dolls, they plan to revolutionize the concert industry with a digital likeness of Ashley, performed by a puppeteer using the Waldo technology. In Washington, the Pentagon announces a new performance-enhancing technology called MASS. In Rome, the European Convention on Human Rights unveils overhauled legislation on the human rights of digital consciousnesses, declaring cookies as legal persons. It becomes illegal to upload consciousnesses into devices incapable of displaying multiple emotions, as well as illegal to deactivate or kill an existing copy. 
In London, journalist Joe Powers suffers death threats after publishing a controversial column criticizing the immolation suicide of a popular disability rights activist. Soon after, she is discovered dead in her home by an apparent suicide, having slit her own throat after stabbing her husband who tried to stop her. Meanwhile, American rapper Tusk suffers similar death threats after criticizing the dancing skills of a young fan, live on a nighttime chat show. Leaving his own show, he has a manic episode in the parking garage before being sedated by a security guard. Taken to a hospital, an MRI reveals a small metal bee inside his brain, which is pulled through his skull by the machine's magnet, killing him. Both deaths are investigated by detectives Karen Park and Blue Colson, who connect them to a social media trend calling for their deaths by way of the death to hashtag. They trace the bee device to a technology company called Granular, which has developed the so-called Autonomous Drone Insects, or ADIs, as a solution to disappearing pollinator populations across the world. The ADIs are completely self-sufficient, with the ability to form like-minded hives and reproduce by building localized 3D printers, though are still able to be directed and controlled by the granular servers if necessary. In their investigation, it's discovered that a hive of ADIs was hacked and redirected, presumably to kill the deceased subjects. Clara Meads becomes the latest target of the Death 2 hashtag, after tweeting a disrespectful picture at a war monument. The detectives rush to protect her from an inevitable swarm of ADIs, which eventually kill her, but leave the detectives unharmed. The public realizes the reality of the Death 2 hashtag, and its use only increases, with the Chancellor of the Exchequer next on the climbing hit list. Using his authority in the government to force a crackdown before he is ultimately killed, the detectives learn of Tess Wallander, a former granular employee who attempted suicide as a result of an online harassment campaign, and link her to the trending hashtag. They find that Tess was saved by her roommate, a granular co-worker named Garrett Scholes. A copy of Scholes' manifesto was found on the ADI which killed Joe Powers. It includes a desire to force people to face their actions and expose them from online anonymity. They track down his former hideout, where they discover a trackable list of every single individual who has so far used the Death 2 hashtag. At Granular, a built-in kill switch is finally decoded, and under federal instruction they attempt to deactivate the rogue ADIs. Realizing too late the trap, the detectives unintentionally trigger Skull's final plan, and the ADIs run rogue, killing all 387,036 people who use the Death 2 hashtag across social media, becoming the largest single loss of life in the history of the United Kingdom. Distraught by her involvement in the tragedy, Detective Blue Coulson goes missing, having presumably killed herself. The trial against Victoria Skillane swings wildly against her favor when the video of the transpirations are discovered and brought in front of the court. She pleads guilty though pronounces that she was under Ian's spell. Following the trial, Skillane is imprisoned at the White Bear Justice Park, an amusement preserve replicating events from the murder, in which she is wiped of her memory and lives through a theatric series of events making her believe that she is awakened in a post-apocalyptic society, in which she is nearly killed a number of times to expose her to the same terror as her victim, before she is reminded of her guilt at the end of each day, before being reset for the following morning, presumably living out her punishment for the rest of her physical existence. Joe Potter finds himself at the center of a serious fight with his fiancée Beth, who blocks him via their Zedi implants after he discovers her to be pregnant. After she leaves, he spends years watching her and the child from afar, both of whom he is unable to properly see due to the block. When Beth is killed in a train accident, the block between Joe and the child is automatically removed. Attempting to properly see the girl for the first time, he discovers she is the product of an affair between Beth and an Asian co-worker. Enraged that his years of watching who he assumed to be his daughter were for naught, Joe assaults Beth's father with a snow globe, killing him. Leaving the scene, a horrified Joe leaves the girl behind. Now with no one to provide for her, the girl leaves the house during a snowstorm to fetch help and ends up freezing to death nearby. Joe is later arrested in suspicion of his involvement in both deaths, though he refuses to plead guilty. In his off hours, Matt Trent moonlights as the operator of an online dating service, by which he and a number of anonymous voyeurs observe, guide, and critique the intimate interactions of his customers, using the Zedi. During one of his coaching sessions, his customer Harry fails to register the subject of his attention as having suicidal schizophrenia. Believing Harry to have the same issues as herself after witnessing him talking to Matt through the Zedi, she poisons him in what she believes to be a double suicide mercy killing. Attempting to cover up his involvement in both the organized voyeurism and the murder itself, Matt accidentally exposes his guilt to his wife, who digitally blocks him. Later, Matt is found legally guilty of his involvement and cover-up in Harry's murder, and agrees to attempt to coerce a confession out of Joe Potter to take time off his sentence. He is eventually successful, and released on the condition that he remains on the sex offender registry, meaning he is visually blocked by every other person with the Zedi. 2022. The Ashley 2 doll is discontinued and recalled for battery issues. 
A year on from the ADI mass killing, Karen Park is called before a federal grand jury to testify about her involvement in the investigation which triggered the event. She has since taken the brunt of the public fury over the tragedy, becoming the face of investigative failure and the loss of over 300,000 lives. Elsewhere, Blue Coulson is still alive, having faked her own death to secretly track down Garrett Scholes in an attempt at vigilante justice. Six months after Ashley O falls into her coma, an Ashley 2 doll owned by superfan Rachel Goggins malfunctions upon reactivating and overhearing an update on Ashley's condition. Attempting to fix the doll with her sister Jack, Rachel unintentionally removes the doll's inhibitor chip, allowing the entire copied consciousness of the real Ashley Ortiz to come to life through the doll. Privy to the truth behind Catherine's motivations, the Ashley 2 doll convinces the pair to break into the Ortiz mansion, where it secretly intends to euthanize the real Ashley and destroy Catherine's business plan. Pulling the plug on her former body, the Ashley 2 doll ultimately awakens Ashley, who, along with Rachel and Jack, rushes to the launch party of the Ashley O concert interface and exposes Catherine, who is arrested and her plans seemingly voided. Later, Ashley expands out from her bubblegum pop image, playing underground clubs across Los Angeles alongside Jack Goggins in a new pop punk outfit. 2023. Continuing the technology used by recallers, in the near future, a near complete majority of people across the United Kingdom are implanted with memory devices called grains, through which they are able to retain, recall, and share records of all memories. Soon after, society has progressed to look down upon those who do not have grains, and emergency and travel services use grain records as proof of identity and witness. Returning home to a dinner party following a failed appraisal at his law firm, Liam Foxwell becomes suspicious of his wife, Fionn, after witnessing slight changes in her behavior when around one of the other party guests, a man named Jonas. Later, Fionn reveals that she had a previous relationship with Jonas prior to her knowing Liam. Frustrated with her poor communication and believing that she's hiding something, Liam obsesses over her behavior and uses his grain to nitpick instances in their relationship to feed his distrust. Upon concluding that Fionn still has feelings for Jonas, Liam visits Jonas at his home and assaults him before driving home intoxicated. Confronting Fionn, she reveals an affair with Jonas, and Liam learns that their daughter, who would have been conceived around the time of the incident, is almost certainly Jonas's child. Distraught and heartbroken, and having destroyed his relationship with his wife, a now lonely Liam relives the happiest memories of his marriage through his grain before forcibly removing the device from his own neck. 2024. The grain technology begins to fall out of style in the United States. In California, the streaming giant Streamberry begins experimenting with quantum computing, eventually discovering the ability to live create digital recollections of its users' daily lives and their routines in the form of sitcoms and dramas, recasting the users by way of digital likenesses taken legally through agreements with prominent actors. Joan Tate, a middle manager at the Silicon Valley startup Sonical, discovers one such show based around her own life called Joan is Awful. The show is watched by a variety of her peers, in which she is played by Annie Murphy, and various details of her choices and interactions exaggerated for dramatic effect. Joan is fired from Sonical after corporate secrets are incidentally leaked in the show, and she learns from her lawyers that Streamberry has complete legal authority to parody her life with the consent that she gave through their terms and conditions. Realizing her last hope is Annie Murphy herself, she defecates in a church to capture the actor's attention, and the act is reenacted in the show. Murphy herself has no legal authority to challenge Streamberry using her likeness, as she signed a lucrative deal for them to copy her digitally for a number of future projects. Left with no other choice, Joan and Annie break into Streamberry headquarters and find the quantum computer, discovering that it has created infinite layered realities of Joan's life using the likenesses of Salma Hayek and Kate Blanchett. Joan destroys the quantum computer, eliminating the layered realities as well as Streamberry's future content library. The pair are both placed under house arrest, later becoming friends. 2025. A dating app uses the technology of digital consciousness to run simulations of relationships using virtual copies of its users to near-perfect efficiency. In one of these simulations, Frank and Amy are paired in the virtual hub to begin a one-night fling, but are later separated and placed into long-term relationships with different, less symbiotic people. After growing tired of these pairings, and longing for the chemistry that the pair had in their single night together, the pair are overjoyed to be paired again, both agreeing not to learn how long they have together in their second attempt. Overjoyed with their blossoming relationship, Frank decides to check the relationship timer to ease his anxiety about losing Amy again. Though it initially gives the pair five years, his decision to check without Amy's permission damages the simulation, and their timer shrinks to expire the next morning. Both furious that the system is taking away a very obvious connection that the pair have, they decide to run away together, revealing to their digital avatars that they are only copies of their original selves, and the app determines the two a match. In reality, Frank and Amy meet at a bar after matching on the app, 
apparently to begin a very real fruitful relationship. Under the leadership of James Walton and Robert Daly, Callister Inc. gains widespread attention for their wildly successful Infinity Program, a virtual reality game which takes the world by storm. On a private server, Daly has created a custom skin of the game based around his favorite TV show, the classic 60s sci-fi show Space Fleet. Daly falls for a new programmer at the company, Nanette Cole. After rejecting his minimal advances, Daly obtains her DNA and clones her into a digital copy to place inside his private Infinity server. This is something he's already done with a handful of co-workers to live out power fantasies in an environment with which he is significantly more comfortable than the real world. While the other clones have been broken into submission to play along with Daly's fantasy, Cole rebels, eventually finding a way to blackmail her real self into destroying Daly's infinity skin ahead of a Christmas update. The sabotage is successful, with the digital clones freed into virtual eternity. Meanwhile, Daly is trapped in the deleted version, which fries his brain in the real world and kills him. Clayton Lay is executed for his crimes. To provide financial security for his family, he agrees to sell the rights to his consciousness to Rollo Haynes, who records a copy of him during the execution, and later uploads it and uses it as the main attraction at his new museum which highlights technological crimes. Lay is horrified to find his new life, to be continually tortured by visitors of the museum by way of an artificial electric chair. When visitation to the museum shrinks over time, Haynes allows richer patrons to stretch the limits of his torture technology, eventually leading to Lay's virtual consciousness tortured into insanity, rendering the exhibition pointless. Lay's wife visits the museum and witnesses the shell of her deceased husband, later poisoning herself to be found by the couple's daughter. After uploading a copy of her mother's consciousness into her own psyche, the daughter, Nish, travels to the museum, destroys her own father's consciousness completely, and kills Haynes before destroying the museum. 2036. The biomechanical company Ticker fully launches San Junipero in its beta phase, in which the users are able to travel to any era of history to live out evenings in a massive online community with hyper-realistic avatars. The program remains in beta phase, primarily used for Alzheimer's therapy and later limited access for the elderly, who are able to use the historical exposure to relive their youth in eras of their choice. Ticker eventually develops the ability to permanently upload consciousnesses to the San Junipero cloud, where deceased individuals are able to live in eternity through a digital copy of their consciousnesses inside the program. Yorkie, a longtime quadriplegic now approaching her deathbed, scouts a test trial of the system prior to uploading her consciousness permanently, during which she meets and falls in love with another dying elderly woman named Kelly, who is simply using the system for therapy in her final days before succumbing to cancer. As Kelly is Yorkie's first relationship due to the accident that made her quadriplegic in her youth, she becomes obsessed, tracking her down in a different time zone after the former disappears from 1987. After making Kelly realize her own feelings for Yorkie, the latter attempts to persuade Kelly to join her permanently inside San Junipero, following her approaching death. Still unsure about her faith in a religious afterlife, where her husband chose to end up after the untimely death of their daughter, who is killed before the development of San Junipero, Kelly eventually changes her mind, and the pair are both uploaded to the Ticker database to live with each other in technological eternity within the program. This is the latest we can give a definitive year to the timeline. We move on to what is presumably decades in the future. Eventually, society hyper-focuses around the concept of social credit scores. Those ranked four stars or above are traditionally seen as the higher class of said society, with the majority of people attempting to boost their social class by way of impressing and receiving high ratings from the upper class. Various privileges in said society are segregated to those above a certain social credit score. Lacey Pound, an office worker desperate to raise her score from a 4.2 to a 4.5 in order to qualify for an exclusive apartment community, is asked by her childhood friend Naomi Blesto to be the maid of honor at her wedding, an offer Lacey later discovers to be an elaborate plan to boost Naomi's own score by way of pity points from her elitist wedding guests. Believing her maid of honor speech will be the perfect way to raise her score high enough and quick enough to secure her deposit on the apartment, an unfortunate series of events, mostly by her own hand, leads to Lacey's credit score falling below levels deemed socially acceptable. And after being uninvited to the wedding, she forces her way into the wedding to forcefully give her speech, during which she threatens a number of guests at knife point and is arrested by local security. After 10 years of war in Europe, technology develops to predict the medical potential of human genetics, finding patterns to determine which populations and trends are predisposed to various diseases and genetic inferiority. A worldwide propaganda campaign eventually results in these genetically inferior individuals being shunned by society, labeled public enemy number one, with very few ordinary people willing to stand up for and protect them. When this campaign turns violent, these inferior individuals, now called roaches, are systematically hunted by military corporations. Roaches are virtually eliminated in the Americas, but still exist in pocket populations throughout Europe, where a religious minority has begun hiding and protecting roaches from the extinction campaigns. 
In Denmark, a soldier called Stripe operates in a squad under the leadership of Medina, all of whom are implanted with mass and optical and audio technology which allows them to focus on their missions with minimal external distractions. During an outing to expose one of these religious hiding holes, Stripe is assaulted with a green laser light by a number of pale monsters, who he kills without second thought. En route back to headquarters, Stripe experiences malfunctions with his mass implant. Though diagnostics find no faults with his implant, Stripe's next mission hits the fan after Medina is killed, and he witnesses squadmate Ray mercilessly kill innocent humans within the hideout. Stripe escapes with these humans while Ray follows, eventually hunting them down and killing the others. Now in a military prison, Stripe learns that the mass system masks the appearance of roaches, and the monsters he destroyed on his first mission were simply innocent humans disguised by his implant. Given the option to have his memory wiped or live through his unmasked mistake until he goes insane, he chooses the former, and is honorably discharged back to the United States, where he lives out the remainder of his existence in a false reality fed by his mended mass implant. Society further devolves into an exploitative class system reflected in health and appearance, rather than just wealth. In a middle-class housing facility, the residents are forced to pedal stationary bicycles, which presumably fuel the greater world inhabited by the upper class. The middle-class bikers are rewarded with digital merit credits, which they use to upgrade digital doppelgangers or pay for limited services. After the death of his brother, Bing Madsen inherits 12 million of his unused credits. Falling for a girl named Abby Khan, he encourages her to audition for the popular talent competition Hot Shots, for which he donates 15 million of his banked merits to pay the audition cost. She wows both judges and audience with her rendition of Irma Thomas's Anyone Who Knows What Love Is, but is pressured into taking a place in Judge Wraith's pornographic subscription series, Wraith Babes. Infuriated at a combination of her failure and exploitation by their decreasingly fulfilling society, Bing overworks the bike system until he once again reaches 15 million merits in credit, then auditions himself for Hot Shots. Upon reaching the stage, he threatens to kill himself on live TV unless the judges allow him to voice his grievances. He delivers a passionate speech about the devolution of consumerism and its exploitation of the one thing he ever took real interest in. The judges offer Bing his own platform to continue expressing his perceived flaws with the system, and he unfortunately leaves the lifestyle of biking to become a streamer. The Far Future The robotic police dogs developed under the premiership of Michael Smart are eventually programmed to replace the mass system in dealing with roaches. Somewhere along their timeline, their programming is sabotaged, possibly intentionally, to register all human life as inferior and the dogs begin executing all humans rather than just roaches. Humanity nearly goes extinct, with a small group of survivors scattered throughout the world. Seeking a specific toy to ease the pain of a dying boy in their camp, a group of survivors raid an abandoned shipping warehouse, only to find and unfortunately awaken a hidden dog waiting in hibernation mode. The dog kills all in the group except Bella, who manages to escape and evade the dog by forcing it off a cliff in her getaway vehicle. Eventually finding a nearby compound whose residents have committed suicide amongst the devastation, Bella removes a tracker which was embedded by the dog earlier in their struggle. The damaged dog manages to find her by following her blood trail. In the ensuing struggle, Bella destroys the dog but becomes embedded with innumerably more trackers, leading to a herd of new dogs to seek her out and destroy her. That is the entire current timeline of Black Mirror. This is the longest scripted and edited video that I have ever created, so if you do like this project and are interested in correcting it and learning more about Black Mirror content, feel free to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment below and let me know what I should change for my next edition of this video. Thanks very much. We'll hope to see you very, very soon.